Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Stace, and as you can tell, my name is certainly from the slide here. I work for Software Solved here in Exeter, and today I'm going to talk about the web, web cryptography API that's available in web browsers. For the last few years, up to five years, we've seen great advancements in web browser, API availability, uh, JavaScript runtimes, to the point where we're now in a position where you can create really compelling experiences and apps using purely web-based technologies. Yeah, come on. There's a few seats there, a couple around the edge there. And um, this gets to the point where if you're looking at a progressive web app or a single page application, uh, you might be looking at storing data locally, or you might be working offline, and there's a lot of technologies that now support that purely within the web browser. And then, that means you need to be thinking about, how am I protecting that data? If you're storing personally identifiable information, everyone's favourite GDPR comes up, and who doesn't love that? Or you might just be storing commercially confidential information and you want that locally within a web browser based app working offline. So we need options to manage this. And my talk today uh, is mainly around the web browser side of things, not the server side with Node.js. There are facilities for that, but this is around the new API that uh, I'm going to be talking about. So why might you not want to do this? Um, NCC Group uh, posted a blog article, it was eight years ago, but actually it's still incredibly relevant. Uh, it's entitled JavaScript Cryptography Considered Harmful, which is basically the opposite of what I'm talking about today. But I do encourage you all to read this. Um, it's very well written, it's easy to read. Um, does cover a number of areas that you do need to think about if you're working with an app in this area and wanting to protect your data. From my reading, it comes down to a couple of key points. One, secure delivery of JavaScript, so your application code, to the browser, which back in 2011, well, we, we had SSL, we had HTTPS. It was possible, but these days it's a lot easier. So a lot was made of that fact back in 2011. It's not as an issue, not mu as much of an issue today. The other side, which we do need to think about, is how the browser JavaScript environment is hostile to cryptography for a number of reasons. A lack of secure random number generator, which is critical to a decent encryption implementation. The malleability of JavaScript runtime. So at runtime, you can go and inspect what's going on, look at the memory, put your own code in there. That is an issue for encryption. Uh, lack of secure arrays capability, so you've used your encryption key to decrypt some data, and then if it sits around in memory waiting for the JavaScript runtime to uh, get rid of it, then that's an attack vector that could be used. Functions with known timing characteristics, which is also very important for cryptography, for not leaking sensitive information. And finally, a secure key store. So back in 2011, all of these issues were an issue for encrypting data within JavaScript within the browser. There are a number of ways you could approach this um, in terms of pure JavaScript implementations of cryptography. That link there um, that goes through a great big list of people who've done this. Um, and I have got these slides on SlideShare with this link at the end, so you don't need to sort of memorize that beautiful URL there. But a couple of them stand out. The Stanford JavaScript Crypto Library is really well thought of, a well-structured implementation that has been investigated and analyzed. It looks really good, but it's still relying on the JavaScript runtime, which in a browser, the malleability side of things that I talked about a moment ago, is an issue. Um, there's another library called JS Encrypt, which is an implementation of OpenSSL RSA uh, a public key cryptography, which sometimes will be useful. Libsodium is another very well thought of library. It's a C library. So um, on native applications, it is used for a number of serious applications that their um, cryptography requirements. And it has bindings for JavaScript, so you could use that in Node.js. 
Someone's also recompiled it into WebAssembly so you can run it in the browser. So great library, well thought of, well structured, well implemented, but still relying on the JavaScript runtime and all those risks around that. And when you go back to that big list at the top, you come across a lot of different random implementations that some, somebody on the internet has done. And they fall foul of basically the first rule of cryptography, which is don't create your own cryptography. Use somebody else's, something that's been inspected and analyzed over the years and proven to be decent. So then along comes the web, web cryptography API, which is a W3C standard. Um, so the link to the uh, standard is there. It's actually quite a readable standard. It's not a massive API, as we will see in a minute. And the uh, Mozilla Developer Network documentation, I've got a link to that there. That is really good, really easy to read, great introduction to the API and how to use it. It has a number of key features. It has a decent random number generator. It has a secure key store and it implements multiple algorithms and modes. And what's really important about it is it's implemented within the browser rather than the JavaScript runtime. So a lot of the protections that we need for decent, reliable cryptography are managed through the browser rather than just a pure JavaScript implementation. It's a little bit small, but this is from caniuse.com. So you can see which browsers <coughs> um, we can use this API in. And you can see, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Safari on iOS, a lot of the modern browsers have had support for it for quite a while. And so we're in this great position where we can use it. IE 11 mm, has an older implementation, but if you're in this um, PWA, SPA space, you're not gonna be targeting IE 11. So I don't see that as really a risk because you need all the other um, APIs that work with that. So, great. We've got this great API. It's avoided a lot of the pitfalls of previous things. So, it's all sunshine and roses, isn't it? However, <laughs> I know nothing, as people often tell me. That is my name, John Stay. Um, and there are some downsides that we do need to consider with this new API. <coughs> First one being, it's called a, well, it's, as you'll see with the code sample I'm gonna show, it has the word subtle in it. And when I first started looking at this, I thought, oh, that's a bit weird, but okay, fine, carry on. But if you go to the Mozilla um, documentation about it, there's a great big red, red warning on it saying, actually, this is a really low level API. It does implement all these cryptographic um, na uh, na elements that you need, but you can really shoot yourself in the foot with it if you don't know what you're doing. So you still need to have a good understanding of cryptography techniques algorithms and the like to not think you're secure and actually you've still left everything wide open. It is reliant on a browser's uh, security implementation of that API of the pseudo random number generator and any sort of protections around cross tab attacks and other things that you need to think about when you're looking at web browser implementations and web apps. Um, but one of the things I tried early on was see if I could sort of put a layer over the, the um, inter API, see if you could intercept all the traffic, which fortunately you can't. And uh, that's really nice because then at least you know when you're talking to this API, you're talking to the browser's implementation. They just don't let you muck around with it. Um, you can obviously inspect the browser's memory. You can go into the JavaScript runtime and you can go looking for unencrypted data once you've worked through that. So that is a risk and that is something you will have to think about no matter what. If you were implementing a native application, you'd have to think about the fact you're keeping unencrypted data in memory because someone could come along, if they had access to the console of your laptop, your computer, they could get at that. Now, that is a problem all over the place. So it's not just relevant to this particular API, but you do have to be aware of it. And of course, old browsers, but as I said, we, in this context, we can ignore old browsers. You know, who cares about old browsers? Nobody has to support them. But let's move on to have a look at the actual uh, documentation on this. This link, it isn't my uh, link, it's something I found on the internet. It's a really good demonstration of the 
scope of the API and the different terms, and hopefully I can bring that up. So I'm just going to sit down for this bit. So what we have here is a live page that you run in your web browser. You can see what parts of the API your web browser supports. You can see down the left-hand side all the different algorithms and the lovely short acronyms. It's so easy to understand. But, and along the top, the methods that the API supports. So we've got encrypt, decrypt, what you'd expect. You can sign and verify plain text. You can produce hashes of uh, text. You can do stuff with keys, which I'll cover in a moment, importing, exporting them. And then this stuff on the end. I've not really had to worry about that um, because of the way we're using, um, we're managing our encryption keys, which is something I'll show in the code demo. But what's great is you can click on one of these links, and if your internet connection is fast enough, you can get a nice little code demo of using that particular algorithm and the methods like generating a key, importing a key, etc. So if we wanted to look at how do we use SHA-512, you can see a nice little way of implementing that. So the way you get at this API is on the browser, the global object is window, then you go crypto and then subtle, I was talking about, and then the methods that uh, you need to use. So if we were wanted to produce a SHA-512 digest of some data, this is how we do it. And they all return promises, so you do need to be aware of that. And you'll see in my lovely code that I've got this lovely sort of Christmas tree structure, and I've got this, then this, then this, then this, but hopefully it will still be understandable. Um, in terms of algorithms, oh yeah, there's green and pink. So this is just this, the person who wrote this is opinion, but I think it's pretty uh, reliable on what you should be using, recommended and discouraged. But so you can see AES is the American encryption standard. It's a symmetric um, encryption algorithm. That's a good one to use. And it has a particular mode of operation, GCM, which you should be using. And then we've got some signing mechanisms here and some hashing algorithms here and a few more key management things. This one we'll come back to and I'll explain what it means in a minute. And then you've got, I don't really know that I've not been using that one. And then we get into the pink stuff, RSA encryption, that's a sort of historic stuff, AES using CRT and CBC and CFB. All of those things, they're not recommended approaches. And actually you'll see, it happens to be Firefox, this one isn't supported at all. This one is, but you really don't want to be using it. Stick to the stuff in green. So back to my slides. I'm going to show you some code, and I'm hopefully going to show you it working as well. But it was working this morning. We shall see. So I've got some code. I have put it up on GitHub. So the link was in the slides, and you can get to that from... Uh, slide share, but what I've done is basically, I've not done anything clever, I kept it all in a, a simple JavaScript file, and then separate, separated out the functions for each sort of aspect of it. Um, I'll quickly show you like, the beautiful version. There you go, isn't that lovely? <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's encryption, it's gotta be raw and sort of utilitarian, but um, it does work. So, when, we, uh, when we're looking to encrypt some data, the approach I'm taking is we get the data that you've typed in. It could come from anywhere. Um, we generate initialization vector. Now, this is needed for the, the encryption approach. And the recommendation that I've seen is that you create a different one for each time you're encrypting some data, which means you need it for the decrypting. So I am storing it with my encrypted data in the database. Um, I prefer not to, but it's not the actual encryption key. So I have seen uh, advice and guidance that this isn't the worst thing you can do. It's all about layers of protection, really. Um, so we create a random uh, in initialization vector we use for our encryption algorithm. And this is using get random values, which is the secure uh, random number generator created by the browser. So we are relying on that. 
we're also picking up our password. So the context of this is that you've got uh, an app implemented in JavaScript and HTML and web technologies. It's running offline. Where do you put the key? Because if you're storing it locally, somebody can come to that computer later and get access to the key and then decrypt your data. So the approach we're taking here is that we derive a key from the password that the user has entered. And therefore, we're never storing it. We're only ever using it to encrypt and decrypt data, and then it's kept outside of the JavaScript runtime. Um, and that's what this API supports. So we take, we're taking the password that the user's typed in. We have a two-stage operation to generate the key that we need for our encryption and decryption. We import it into the runtime. We then derive an encryption key with it. That's wobbling a little bit, but focus on the right-hand side. Um, we also need a salt. And this is another one that we, we need for both encryption and decryption, and we need to store somewhere. Um, in my example, I've cheated and just generated one up here of one, two, three, four, five. That's not the best. But if I was doing this in production, what I'd probably do is create a salt for each installation of the application, store that in local storage with the browser so it's different for each client, and then use that for my encryption and decryption. You get it on one computer, you're not, it's not the same on a different computer, so it's all about managing that risk. Um, we're also using this text encoder and text decoder API, which is another HTML5 API that IE11 doesn't support. So it's another reason to avoid those kind of browsers, those older browsers. But we always need to uh, encode it into a, an array of bytes for processing. So anyway, back to where I was. We've imported the key. We have derived our key that we're going to use, and we've passed that into the encryption function that actually takes our encoded data as a byte array. So it's taken it as a string, converted it into byte array with, I believe it's UTF-8 encoding. The derived key and our initialization vector, that encrypts that data and returns a byte array of encrypted data. What I'm now doing, this line here, is storing that in index DB. So we've got it locally in the browser. So we can come back to it later if we've closed the browser and reopened it. And um, I happen to be using a library called Dexy, which makes it working with IndexedDB easy because IndexedDB, like Web Cryptography API, is a low-level API. It, you want to use a, a wrapper around it. Um, Dexy works really easily. So I've got a table called Encrypted because I couldn't think of anything better. Um, we're storing an object which has our encrypted data and our initialization vector. I will show you that in a minute. And then with my fantastic user experience skills, I'm using the alert function <laughs> to show you the ID of the record that we've just saved. When we want to decrypt data, we basically go through the same process. We grab the same password. We take the ID of the record, convert that to a number. We're loading it from the database, and then we go through the same process of importing the key when we need it, generating the, key, the deriving the key, decrypting the data, and then showing the, again, alerts, showing the decrypted text, decoded text. So, very quickly, the actual usage of the API. Ignore this, this is just Dexy set up the database. The importing the key, we encode, we encode it, we use import key, it's a raw format. There's a couple of formats, the JSON web key format, which is a structured format, and raw. But because this is just something we've typed in, we import it as raw. We're going to use this algorithm. And this parameter tells you that you can't export it from the runtime. You can't, it's, you've imported this key into the runtime. It's managed by the browser. Nobody can easily get at it unless they're going into the memory of the browser process itself. And we also supply an array of methods that can use this key. So we can contain what's used with it, sort of further restricting our, our sort of exposure. So we import it, and then all we're going to do is derive a real key from it. And then that's what this does, derive key. We're using the password-based key derivation function. That's what that stands for, version two. Um, and that 
does some heavyweight conversion. It's apparently it's slow deliberately, so you can't use it to um, work out what raw text you've passed in. We're running it for 10, 100,000 iterations. Why have I picked that? Because that was the example I saw on the internet. <laughs> I'm sure it's great. 10,000, I could have put one. I'm probably thinking that's not going to be great. Um, and we happen to use SHA-256 for the hashing of that. And then we're, we're passing in the key. We're going to use it for AES, for the actual encryption, 256 for the length of that. We're not allowing it extracted, but you can allow that and then import export key can be used for that. We're only going to allow encrypt and decrypt for this key. We then move on to the encryption. Again, we're telling it what we're using, the initialization vector I talked about earlier, the derived key, and the raw text, and that encrypts our data. Decrypt does pretty much the same thing. We've already derived our key. Um, we use this algorithm and the in initialization vector we saved to decrypt the data. So let's see if it actually works. So let's think of a great password. No one will have thought of this password. That's good. Well, we can do better than that. Let's put a uh, capital P in there. Ooh, probably need to put one, two, three in there somewhere. Oh, and uh, oops, strange keyboard. Let's put, let's change that. No one will have thought of that. That's a great password. And what should we type tech? It's a turn, I can't type it right. But you can see that this is a live demo by doing that. Live demo. Ah, it's gone completely <laughs> mental, hasn't it? So, encrypt the data. That returns record eight. Hopefully, 12 will come up. No, that's not that. I've pressed a key. There we go. So this is the um, this is Chrome, and these are the Dev Tools, and we can see in our index DB it's called Encryption DB. Again, I could call that whatever I want. I had no imagination. So Encryption DB and the tables encrypted. You can see the data that we've got in there, and the in initialization vector is just a no load of numbers which were randomly generated, and the encrypted data is stored as a couple of byte arrays that. If we were to try and decode them, it would just be look like random data. So we've got that in there. It's record eight. I could close Chrome and reopen it, but my keyboard's playing up, so I'm not going to do that. But we want to decrypt record eight. Let's just clear that just to prove I'm not making it up. Keep the same password because otherwise it's not going to work. Decrypt data, and there you go. It's remembered the text, and it's got that from index DB. We could have saved that and come back to it later. We're managing the um, key correctly, as far as I can tell, and it's decrypted our data for us. So moving back to my slides. To summarize, because I'm running out of time. Web Crypto API, it's, it's a relatively new API, but a lot of modern browsers support it. So it's, it's been maturing quite nicely. We do have to be careful about this subtle API aspects and you can still shoot yourself in the foot. You need to pick the right algorithms. That 100,000 iterations thing, you might want 10,000. Um, it's a trade-off. It does have a decent pseudo random number generator and a key store. It supports hashing, signing and encryption algorithms and it is far better than no encryption at rest at all. So in terms of managing the risk of exposure to your data, you've got encryption in transit with SSL or TLS. And now you have an option for encrypting at rest and use that as a layer of security around managing other layers of security, like in protecting the passwords and the keys used. Um, it is now an option that we can use. So any questions? Yes? Uh, you said it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot of the API. Um, yes. Do you know of any um, like wrapper libraries that have been built on top of this API? I did find, I did find a couple, um, and again, they were just ones found off the internet. So, how trusted can they be? The Mozilla Developer Network. If you go to that, have a look at that. It's really um, easy to read, and you might find that a couple of the examples look very similar to my code there. Yeah. Um, <laughs>